Hi everyone. Welcome to All of the Secrets to App Success, a lecture with Dr. Moon Jin Wei. I hope you all can hear me right now. And if you can, please type yes in the chat. All right. So that means you guys can successfully hear me right now. So in this lecture, we'll be discussing how do you make your app stand out from others, right? Especially after the recently concluding of the MIT Summer Appathon, if you guys seen the recently released finalists, you might be wondering, why might have my app not win or become a finalist? It may not even be that your app is bad. It could just be the presentation of it. And that's why in this event, we will be talking about the importance of presentation and how you can make your app stand out from other apps. Obviously, I know that most of you guys know Apping Club, but if you haven't, make sure you join Apping Club. Apping Club, as you all know, we empower education and we have a collaborative community that support each other and share ideas. And we have, we are contributing to a meaningful impact. We want to app in together, app for good. We want to create apps where you can impact the world in a positive light. And with Apping Club, you should be able to have a higher chance of getting further success in this path of creating apps. As we empower you guys with knowledges and events such as this, which can engage you guys with these kind of discussions and knowledge. So definitely, if you're not in Appen Club, make sure you join. I'll be sharing the slides link, which you can be able to find the Discord server and our website by clicking on the icon in our slides. All right, the link is now posted in the chat. But anyways, to continue, let's introduce our guest speaker for today. Huge round of welcome to Dr. Meng Jingwei. Dr. Meng Jingwei holds an MBA from the renowned Kali School of Business at Indiana University, which he specializes in finance and supply chain management. Beyond his academic achievements, he has held pivotal roles such as operations manager and later as a director of a high school port screening at Indiana University School of Medicine. With a rich blend of hands-on managerial experiences and deep academic insights, Dr. Meng Jingwei is a respected figure at the crossroads between science and business, currently serving as an adjunct lecturer at Indiana University. But anyways, we're welcome. We're honored to have Dr. Meng Jingwei here today. So let's now have him continue. All right. Thank you, Tony, for the welcome. And uh, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, let me start the sharing. And an app, you probably uh, wrote so many over your past, uh, past academic or uh, personal enjoyment. But how, like Tony said, how to make an ad is uh, useful or maybe uh, go viral for everyone. So that is actually something I we want to discuss here today. But I have to admit, this is a rather, uh, this is a rather broad question we're going to cover today. So bear with me. I'm trying to uh, um, cover as many topics as possible, but a lot of them may be just on the on the surface side. Uh, and uh, but I do encourage you to uh, explore more. Okay. So what we're going to do today is uh, we'll cover five perspectives. Uh, learning, uh, learning business. What is business? And also uh, identifying the business potentials. And we'll do uh, two case studies, uh, actually just uh, two uh, examples. And uh, we're talking a little bit about marketing and presentation skills so that you can get a jump start. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, some conclusions over there. All right. Uh, first thing about myself, uh, as you, uh, as Tony mentioned, my name is Jingwei Meng. And uh, uh, I received my bachelor's degree from Peking University, and I still uh, consider this is number one university in China. And I got my PhD from Duke University and my MBA degree from Kelly School of Business. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I went to San Diego Supercomputer Center as a program analyst and yeah. over the past years. And uh, I also uh, serve as operation and financial consultant for several companies. And currently, I'm a faculty member with uh, Indiana University. And over my spare time, I normally just uh, uh, devoted myself in, into a lot of educational services. One of them is a music education, a virtual evaluation platform, 
This was done with the professors from Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. And the other major part, which is the MBA for Youth program and aiming to provide business educations for middle school and high school students. And uh, so, and you can tell that I kind of uh, go through the STEM perspectives of the education, right? If you look at my PhD degree, I got majored in pharmacology. And uh, so let me, let me just uh, start by asking some of you some questions. Okay, so my question is uh, actually rather general. And uh, so when did you uh, learn programming? And when did you write your first app? Any app, not, not just a mobile app, but rather uh, something, um, some, some programming. Anyone, just a volunteer. I don't want to, you know, point my finger, so uh, draw someone, but give me, give me a data, give me something. How about Tony? To answer your question, I started doing programming maybe like three years ago. And usually then that was when I first started interacting with language like Python and JavaScript. All right. How about uh, how about Cody? I started learning my like uh, C plus plus and used the MIT app uh, like when the summer started and I had some free time. So, so yeah. When did you write your first app and what's it about? Uh, it was like one of those uh, tutorial apps in MIT App Inventor about oh, okay. learning all of the the like stuff and I started it this summer. All right, all right. When did you learn the programming and the uh, when did you write your first app? Okay, Michelle, what do you think? Um, I started uh, like two years, two, two to three years ago in the summer when I had extra time. All right, so uh, what did you write uh, the, the first program? Uh, the, the around world. the same time, around the same around time. Around the same time. What's this about? Um, it was like, I learned it with like MIT App Inventor. So it was like really basic apps with like, I see. yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Experience, okay. I actually start to learn the programming when I was in seventh grade. Okay, and uh, during that time, that was back in 1986, <laughs> a long time ago, same to me, even for me. And uh, I learned basic from computer called Apple II. None of you ever know those, probably. But that's when I first uh, uh, learned my first uh, programming, basic. And uh, the first program, I, I still remember the two programs or two apps I, I wrote during my uh, seventh grade. And one of them is actually a drawing program. So basically, if you type in some, something like, uh, there's a select of options. And if you select, like, a heart, or oh, if you select an arrow, and uh, and then my program will draw the heart on the screen. Well, the resolution is roughly about 64 times 64 pixels, but it actually covers the whole screen. And if you type the word like arrow, and it will be draw an arrow on the side of the Hello. screen. And uh, if you type in something like, uh, um, in my case, to make it funny, if you type arrow and heart, it will actually give you a broken heart. You know, the heart like piece by the, by the arrow. So this is my, actually my first the drawing program I ever wrote with a basic on a computer Apple II. The other program I, I still remember is actually it's a it's a, a canon shooting game. Like you actually use the left and right arrows. You can adjust the angle with a canon on the ground. And when you press the space bar, it will shoot a big bullets out and it's showing the trajectories and he was shooting from something falling from the star, from, from the sky, like a, a star. I think it's a, just, a, just a simple star, drawing with a star and it's falling. If you aim it correctly and you will, you know, make it uh, explode. 
save the planet, basically. So I still remember those two, but but I I have to admit I'm actually uh, pretty pretty much a few of the students actually learn how to program and uh, on an Apple II computer mm -hmm. during that time. Remember that's 1986, right? But you do have a completely different environment than 1980s, mm -hmm. right? You probably have the, you touch base, maybe your parents actually know how to program. And maybe even in your, in your school, they provided the class like you can do some uh, coding, right? So if I put that, put your academic knowledge into a timeline through the K to 12, and I would say you probably start in the elementary school, you start to learn the numbers, basic language skills, social study, natural sciences, and in the grade six, you start to uh, learn algebra, pre-algebra, read the chapter books, word study, basic science concepts, and later on algebra one, writing, history, and then finishing your middle school, you started to uh, learn how to write essays, US history part, geometry, and then until you getting into the high school, you learn algebra two, biology, and maybe you're starting to learn computer science, right? But some of you actually start much early in your middle school. And then eventually you get into calculus and you do the research, AP classes, chemistry, physics, and et cetera, until you are finishing your high school. But you can see that although you have a lot of extracurricular opportunities, you don't have a lot of uh, programming classes implemented in your academic middle school and high school. And even worse, if you're looking at a business, maybe until you are reaching um, grade 10, 11 or 12, then the classes uh, you are being offered is actually something like economics. Oh, some school actually offer you a little bit about personal finance, right? Not much business at all. So, and, and right now, here's a, here's a challenge. How do you integrate the knowledge you learn, not just from schools, but rather from actual curriculum classes. For example, the coding, it doesn't matter with Perl, with Python, with C++, with Java, but coding itself, plus with some knowledge you did not even learn from your school and you want to put them together. So that's actually a challenge. But before we go into what we're going to do, how to face this challenge, let's talk about a very fundamental question. So what is business? So if I want to summarize everything, that will be a business is really talking about the entity striving to reach its beneficial goals. And what, what is the beneficial goals? It can be financial and can be non-financial. Okay, and, and now let's look at the, the benefits part, right? Who's going to receive the benefits? And I would divide it into three perspectives, right? Okay, number one, the business owners, the executive members, the employees of that specific business entity. And this is uh, talking about from a company perspective. And second, it must be the users of the business product you provide, right? And that is a special name for customer. And the third is actually talking about society, basically the external impact of your business operations. So when you run your business, it's always coming from these three perspectives. And uh, we are going to revisit this uh, benefit in a few moments, okay? But before that, 
I like to talk about what's inside the business and what we can learn from the business. Okay, so here is the system of business education in my mind. So the number one part will be the marketing. Basically, you find your customers, the beneficiaries, one of the beneficiaries, and you try to sell to them. But strategy part is actually how you provide your story for some other people and so that you create your sales. And that is the strategy. And the third part is actually operation. You do have to run your business, right? It's not like uh, computer games, you click a button and the computer program will done everything for you, but it's rather you have to run it, but how to run the business. So that's the third part. And the last part is actually the support, the financial support and the monetary support. And with all those four perspectives, those are the four major area you have to know when you run your business. With other things, for example, negotiation, law ethics, psychology, those are something that maybe not belong to any one of the tracks, but it's actually something very important. Those are the knowledge can be used in all the perspectives. But overall, we are talking about uh, entrepreneurship. Okay. So with this uh, very specific system of business education, I like to give you my ideal business education if I want to persuade you to start a business, okay? Remember, this is actually not implemented in your academic classes, but rather something maybe you need to seek some actual curriculum activities, all right? So here are a few questions I want to ask you. Number one, why you write your app? Simple, right? Simple question, but that could be the question will hanging over your head for a long, long time throughout your career. Why you want to write your app? And let me just uh, summarize a few potentials, right? It could be just for fun, right? Like, like me, when I wrote my first app, I'm drawing the heart, I'm drawing the arrow, and if you type them together, you actually got a broken heart. So that's really for my personal fun. I just feel that this is uh, interesting and I can do it, right? So that's also a part of way that I show off my skills because I just, I can. I can do it, but well, other people cannot. And there are some special purposes, right? For you, maybe it's just part of the homework. I just have to. Maybe it's a convenience for yourself or maybe for others, or maybe you're just looking for that particular app function you're looking for, or maybe you are trying to write an app to reach certain financial benefits, right? So with that in mind, I don't know why you want to write your app, but I would say you definitely write the app with a purpose. And now, let's talk about, let's say if you already finish an app, okay? You finish an app. And what's the question in your mind you should ask yourself? The number one will be who will be the users, right? But the underlying question to this specific user question is actually, what value we can provide to your customers? What value of your app can be provided to the users? It can be many things. Let me just list you a few, okay? 
For example, it's just for the easy and convenience, right? This something can do, this app can do certain tasks. Then uh, if you do it all by yourself and it will be difficult, but right now I'm providing you a tool, an app to finish that specific function. That's for the easy of use and convenience. Oh, it could be just a cool factor, you know. This is a really cool app. I just want to do a show off my capability to do it. And it could be just a say, I'm, I'm very proud I can do it and showing that the ownership. And it could be, a, you know, you write some app for a specific reason like a protection safety, maybe a monitoring system, or maybe a warning alarm. And uh, it could be just a health and wellness. And some people write an app to monitor the health of personal or group of people, or maybe manage the exercise. Or maybe it's really just for financial gain of your app, right? So you write it and you wish you can sell it to someone, or maybe you have some user to pay you to use that specific app, that's also okay. And eventually just uh, some people just like to write some adventurous uh, stuff, right? Very special ones. And uh, I like to uh, present you that I can do it and to show off my skills, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, those are not all the reasons, but Hopefully, by looking at this list, it will give you a sense who will be the users and what value you can provide to them. Okay, so let's talk about two examples. Maybe some of you actually know those. The first example I want to use is Receptify. Anyone know this, uh, this plugin of Spotify? Yes, no, anyone? Someone type in the chat. Anyone use this? No, yes, I'm surprised. Well, this app is actually a quite simple one. And the author of this app is actually Michelle Liu and who's actually a Carnegie Mellon University senior this year and they're going to graduate in winter. And uh, she wrote in wrote this app within a day in September 2020. And uh, here is what she wrote. He wrote, had an urge to make something today, so I spent the day coding this. It generates a receipt based on your most played tracks on Spotify. So tell me who will be the users? Anyone? Spotify listeners, exactly. Very simple, right? Because it's mentioned that. So what this app do, it's actually quite simple. Once you log in in their website and you can link your Spotify account with this program, this plugin, and it will generate a receipt, very similar to what I showed over there. And it shows an uh, older number, your name, the date, list of your top 10 songs, showcasing names, each song's length, item count, total amount, how long all the song added up, a fake credit card number, blah, blah, blah. Basically, it's a receipt. Well, is this a simple thing to do? Many of you actually already imagine you are doing it, right? And it took Michelle a day to code this. And right now it actually has over, I don't remember, I think it's a three, several million user, active user, uh, two to three million people. And that seems a very simple case, right? A simple app to write and you can do it. Everyone can do it probably. But think about the underlying convenience of this app and think about the customer base. So this is actually an app that actually I'm a little bit surprised at the very beginning because I'm actually not a Spotify user. 
I actually don't share a lot of my social identities on the internet. So, but I'm sure many people will give it a try, right? Let's see what, what, what is it like with the receipt type of uh, playing list, right? But this is actually something Michelle did when uh, I think when she was uh, the first year in the Carnegie Mellon University and just to a day. Another example is more recent. That is GPT-0. Everyone knows chat GPT, right? And you just have to know that. But chat GPT, you know, as a chatting robot is actually pose and challenge to teachers like me. And when I give out the homework right now, my feeling is, mm, how did my student finish it? And did that student actually use the chat GPT to generate the essays? And this will be actually something in the future when you try to write an essay for your homework, for your college applications, for your camp applications, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to admit, that the writing style of ChatGPT sometimes is, well, I, I don't want to say always, but most of the time actually did better job than myself, okay? So for me, I sometimes uh, use it to uh, generate some contents that I use. Of course, I always do the modification part, but sometimes it's just much better than myself using it, okay? So with that in mind, so a Princeton senior this year, actually uh, called Edward Tian, and he actually wrote some app called GPT-0. So basically, here is what he said. He said, there's so much chat GPT hype going around. Is this and that written by AI? We as humans deserve to know. So this is actually what uh, what he wrote. He wrote the chat GPT to use two measures. One is called perplexity. The other one is a burstiness. And with those two measures, it's looking for if a script is low complexity and more uniform, and that will be an AI generated script. Okay, what do you think? Who will be the users? What will be the functions? So I'm not going to ask you to give me a lot of information, but I do want you to think about those two apps. The first app, Receptify, the second app, GPT-0. And I want you to think about from following business pitch. So the number one will be your app functions. What are the functions? What's the functions that your app can provide? The second, what's the value associated with its function? Remember here the value we're talking about who will get benefit from its functions. And that benefit is actually the value you provided to the customer. And based on that, think about the target customers. Who will be the number one group of people who will use your app, receive the benefits provided by your app functions? And the next one, where and how you want to reach your target customer? So basically, you are looking for that group, group of people. And then how to transform the customer value into your business strategy and then expand your customer base. Okay, I'm actually will not talk all of them. This seminar will only serve as a guideline. If I have to talk about everything, that will be hours long. <laughs> It's almost impossible to cover within this uh, one hour time frame. 
But I do want you to think about it. I do want you to think about this order of the business pitch. Even before you start to code, and those should be the questions you put up front before you write your code. Number one, think about the functions. Number two, think about the value. Number three, think about who will get benefits. Number four, think about that particular group of people, big or small. You don't have to reach everyone, by the way. You only need to find those people who are interested. And then fifth question, where and how to reach them. And then next one, transform your customer value, how to design your business strategy. And then the last one, how to expand your customer base based on your business strategy. So hopefully those will be those will be a very quick guideline before you write any app. Okay. And the second part of today's seminar will be presentation. And again, this is a really big topic here and I cannot cover everything. So I'm just going to provide a guideline and give you some examples, all right? Okay, the guideline is quite simple. The first question, audience, you are creating business presentation to someone, right? And the first thing you have to know is, who do you present to? If you don't know that, you cannot even start your presentation. Second, you are going to do something with your presentation. That is the message you want to deliver. What will that message be? Are you trying to persuade other people that your app is brilliant? Or are you trying to persuade the board of directors saying, hey, this app can get a lot of customers. You are going to make a lot of money. It will generate a lot of revenue for the company. Or it can be something that, well, my app is actually present an immediate social benefit for people who use it. For example, it will monitor people's uh, um, maybe anxiety and help people to prevent potential uh, damage to their personal life. So that's something you have to think about. And what method, what's the content you want to use to deliver this particular message? And the last one is the protocols you want to use. So let me just give you some examples that will wrap up this presentation guideline part, okay? Number one, who's your audience? I'm going to give you uh, some examples and I want you to give me uh, the answers, okay? I'm good, just going quickly to, uh, uh, to uh, just call upon everyone, all right? First one, who are they? The students, they're happy. Okay, all right, that's good, okay? Second picture, um, okay, maybe sports. Well, I would actually thinking, since they're always wearing those band and seems very excited, it's probably maybe a company event, maybe a sports event, something like that, right? Okay, how about the third one? And uh, with the setting here, I would say probably it's uh, maybe a concert or maybe an orchestra or maybe a opera thing, right? Very formal. Okay, definitely not uh, something uh, um, you, you can take it for granted, right? Okay, now, if you are a presenter and you're going to present to those three group of people, are you going to use the same tone, same picture, same way to speak? So that is the question 
you always want to understand before your presentation. If you want to present to the first group of people, the students, and your tone will be rather active, will be try to encourage them participation. But for the second group, you are going to show your professional, but rather you want to do inspirational speech. But for the last one, you are going to act like you are a professional and you are trying to give a very formal and professional presentation, right? So think about the first question. Who is your audience? Will be always the first thing you have to understand. And that will determine your style. Second question, what message do you want to deliver? Well, a simple message, right? So how about this logo? When you show this logo, it's probably chemistry, right? And when you show this, very simple politics. And how about this one? If I show you this, you probably feel that, hmm, that's interesting. What will that be? They actually give a very direct message to you. That is probably country music, right? Probably even a country music festival. And then what about this message? The message will show in the humor. The message is trying to attract your attention, saying, hey, this is interesting, right? We're going to send this for the cloud computing. Is that the way we send it over? So that's being humor. So if you look at all those ways, all those messages you are trying to deliver to your audience, and you have to choose different ways to deliver it. And now, I let me give you a, a challenge here. Spend some time to read it. So question your mind and the question I want to ask you. Number one, who will be the audience of this slide? Number two, what message it delivered? Well, the uh, audience might be uh, maybe um, students that are trying to learn about um, this conflict or uh, could also, I mean, could also, um, be important like government officials or something mm -hmm. that are, um, like a press conference like right yeah okay and the oh. message oh, mm -hmm. and the message would be like uh there's a lot of conflict in iraq depending on the audience if it's like a press conference they might uh present this in order to show that there is a lot of conflict and then it must be stopped if it mm -hmm. was in front of students, then it, it would just be for educational purposes. All right, all right, that's very good. Actually, I think I actually got the point, but let me ask you a follow-up question. Do you like this slide? Is this clear to you? Is the message delivered to you very clearly? A Not bit. really. A bit, right? Okay, so let me show you a modification of this slide. What do you think? Much better. Much better, right? Why? Why is much better? Because it's a much more clean. There's less words on the slide that are uh, hindering the important meanings. And the visual is also uh, looks more uh, appealing. Okay, okay, perfect. The reason is I try to show you and this is actually actually done by our professionals. <laughs> but it's actually missed the point because they showed all the information here, but it's actually failed to deliver a clear message. Well, if you read this through, you will get the message. But in reality, that simple graph will actually give you a better demonstration of the message delivered. Okay, uh, I got a question from Justin. It said, wouldn't this technical be missing some information? Can you uh, specify what it's about? Like, so it has some parts like like the, on the left side of the previous graph. Mm -hmm. Like the the next graph doesn't have those. Does is it? Are those like key points? Okay, well, this is exactly 
what you are trying to what you are trying to do. You want to deliver the message, but you don't want to crowd people's mind. So you can show this, but you are going to present with the information you provided. So basically, you show this slide, but in your script, you provide the information, the key rate, additional indicators, those information. If you throw this slide on the audience, audience will be lost. They actually, most of them will just focus on reading, but not your presentation. But what's the purpose of your presentation? You are trying to tell them that this is your current state and it's getting worse. Okay. So that is actually the point. It did missing all the information. So here is actually comes with my number one recommendation for every one of you. When you do the presentation, don't just throw your script on the slide. Make a bullet point. Make sure you have a delivered message, clean and simple. And remember in presentation, there's a one phrase I always use, um, which hello? is which is simple is the new smart. Try to use a simple way, clean way to deliver your message. All right? Okay, now how to deliver your message? And here comes many things, especially during your business presentation. You use your text, you use the sound, you use the picture or graphs. So that's actually the three major things you can use. I throw in the tables as a mixture of text and pictures. And look at this same picture with a color change. One side give you gloomy feeling, right? Cloudy. The other side give you happiness and sunny feeling. So this is a this is a way of the color designation of your whole slide. The next one, what do you feel about this one? What's the first impression you jump out of it? Overwhelming, exactly. I feel it's overwhelming, but you do remember it, right? What's this color for? Why they use this uh, really vivid color? It gives you the action, right? So in particular, that neon yellow greenish is actually quite interesting. Calvin, what's, uh, what's your words? Um, so uh, at first I have to say my English is not the best because I'm from Germany and I learn English. Uh -huh. But um, so I think um, the contrast of the colors are very, uh, is, the contrast is very good. Uh, because of the bright uh, green and the uh, pink and the black. Uh -huh. So I think it's made very good. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So you see, this is a jump out of the screen, right? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. But if you have this feeling and you will definitely feel that, why, what kind of music it's going to give you, right? It's definitely not classical music. <laughs> Right? It's not a soothing music. No, of course not. Um, maybe it's uh, the modern music. Yeah, like a hip hop of the... Uh, yes, maybe, yes. Yeah. Right, right, very active. So just using the color contrast and it's actually give you the feeling of what the presenter wants you to feel. And if you read the details, they're actually saying Nebula, 88, club and bar. Okay, you know this is the bar. Okay, and how about this one? What do you feel? The presenter actually used this uh, rather, rather hell-like color, right? And it gives you the feeling that, oh, our earth is doomed, right? And this yes. is exactly what they want you to feel. And how about this one? It, it's like a fun kind of color. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's something like, hey, hey, this is a lesson. This is a this is a definitely. If you if I want to say, it, this is probably for the kindergarten and uh, elementary school students, with all the shapes, with all the color choice, with even the font, what kind of font they use, with all those in mind, that actually already deliver you a message. So. This is actually saying that you have to choose your presentation style carefully based on the audience. How about the last one? This is actually something I want to particularly to show you. They actually try to use a black and white contrast. And at the same time, they show you the numbers. They show you the number 65.5%. And they also show you search engine optimization one in five pages. So this is actually providing you some big contrast when they use the color to give you the impression. Okay. So I like to, uh, uh, let me see. Oh, it's already five. Okay, so I'd like to, to wrap up with my presentation here. It's actually you as a student to write the apps. Venus. I want you to feel that whenever you do this, you have to think from a perspective of running a business. So the guidelines I provided earlier, talking about the functions, the values, the customer strategy, expand the customer base, those are the business perspectives before you are trying to write any app. And the second part of my presentation is actually something that I want you to know that remember the guidelines of the presentation. Number one, remember the audience. Number two, what is the message you want to deliver? Number three, choose properly the way how you deliver your message. All right, so that will conclude my presentation here. Uh, any questions? You are a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so, uh, well, I think it's actually coming with two perspectives. Number one, you do have an app which can follow the business pitch. So this is actually something about the content. And you, you just have to have that content first. The second part is how you're going to present it. And how you're going to present it is actually coming with my suggestions to you that is with the presentation guidelines. You think about the judges. And you have to remember if the judges has been reading maybe tens of hundreds of apps presentation before and uh, what they are feeling. And you have to think about the audience and then you have to use the way, the basic guideline here, try to deliver a simple message. And what the simple message is, is actually coming from this coming from the business pitch. So for example, if your app has a function saying, well, we're going to, uh, we're going to monitor people's anxiety level by asking students to uh, uh, answer some survey questions, right? It's a simple app to do, right? With some analysis and then you follow this, uh, think about what functions, what's the value provided? And those are, the questions, those are the message you want to deliver over here. So you have to put all those things together. You cannot just say, well, uh, they only look at the presentations. Well, what do you present? You have to present the content here, right? But what's the best way to present this content over here? And that is actually the presentation skills. 
All right. So without any other questions, I'll uh, hand the presentation back to Tony. All right. Thank you for Dr. Wang Jingwei coming on to this lecture and giving us such great insights and knowledge. So thank you. But to wrap up, I don't really have that much to say other than uh, thanks everyone for coming to this event today. Just waiting for the screenshot to load. And obviously, if you have any questions or whatever, feel free to email us through appingclubstudent at gmail.com or join our Discord server if you haven't already. Uh, I have sent the link to the slides again into the chat. Also, if you're wondering how do you join our Discord, you can just click on the icon and we have our Discord links and all of our links located, located there. And in addition, make sure to follow our Twitter and YouTube. I know this sounds very cliche, but we do post all of our events on um, YouTube channel. So you can view if you didn't come or if you missed a certain part.